And you're very welcome to the RT Rugby Podcast as Ireland prepared to take on Italy in the Six Nations this weekend. Bit strange to have the Six Nations at the end of October, but there you go. I'm joined this week by Bernard Jackman, Fiona Coughlin and Wes Liddy. We'll come to them in just a second. But four new faces in Andy Farrell's Ireland 23 for Saturday. Two new caps in the starting 15 in Hugo Keenan and Will Connors and Jemison Gibson Park and hooker Ed Byrne set to make their debuts off the bench. So Addy Farrell was up in front of the media this afternoon. He spoke about what fans can expect from his team on Saturday, but first asked about Jacob Stockdale and what he'll offer at fullback and if he has confidence that Newcaps Will Connors and Hugo Keenan can make the grade. We do, definitely. Obviously, we've had a few days together, uh, see how they... Uh... They fit into the uh, new systems, etc., and the pressures of international rugby being able to uh, adapt pretty quickly to all all new calls, etc., and and uh, adapt to the pressures of international rugby and the new team teammates, etc. So uh, obviously, Will's been involved with us before. He's been chomping at the bit for a while, and uh, he had a seven-month break to to think about that, and he's he's come back in pretty good form. Um, so we're excited about seeing him. And obviously, Hugo, he's had a great start after lockdown. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's, a, he's an exciting player that can play in a, a variety of different ways. And uh, yeah, they're both ready to go. We've obviously had quite a few sessions under our belt now. So we, we've looked at different combinations and we've been very impressed with Jacob. Um, I think he's learning the trade pretty quickly there in, in, in the backfield. Um, he's learning how to uh, uh, adapt and get, himself, uh, and get himself stronger in that position. Uh, we think he's got all the attributes to, to push forward in that position and uh, of course there's going to be elements of his game that we, we, we need to keep pushing forward but um, yeah we, we see you know Jacob what you, what you don't see on, on the wing from time to time is his skill level you know he's, he's, uh, he's got a great vision he's able to see things and uh, he's got good hands as well he hits a brilliant line and not always do you get to do that from, from, from the wing. So hopefully we can get him involved as, as much as we possibly can. And also, he's uh, obviously a, a great option though with a left boot at the back. Well, I hope that you see an energy in defence that is, uh, is, is pretty ruthless. Uh, I hope you see a, a dynamism in our contact skills that, that gets the ball back. I hope you see a set piece that is um, th that is one that's aggressive, that's going after them as well. And on the back of that, we, we hope to get uh, um, some opportunities to play on the back of that and be clinical on the back of it. That's that's what we're hoping for. But obviously, the Italians will have something to say about that. Um, uh, knowing knowing uh, Franco and, and the way that he wants to play, I've heard that they've had quite a quite a few camps, so the preparation would have been. Uh, pretty pretty good for them. They've nothing to lose. I like the style of rugby that they, that they want to play. They're throwing the ball around, so they're going to be dangerous on Saturday. So they're, they'll have a shout in how we, how we play as well. So that was Andy Farrell there. And uh, Bernard Jackman, I guess your, your initial thoughts on the starting 15. There's some new faces there. It's a new look team, some positional switches as well. Overall, are you, are you happy that we have a, an Ireland team that you're excited to see this weekend? Yeah, I think, I think it's great for Will Connors. Obviously, uh, he has been in great form at the start of the season, and I know Andy Farrell. Had, you know, he, he mentioned having him uh, very close to the squad squad last year, so he's going to get his first cap, and it's a it's a great opportunity for him. Keenan, in fairness, is, is impressed. Um, any opportunity he's got, it's interesting that you know he, I think the big call is going with Stockdale at fullback. In, in fairness, I was very critical of him a couple of weeks ago, but he he had a very good game against the Ospreys um, uh, two or two weeks ago. Uh, for Ulster away from home, he looked really busy. Um, played with a lot of conviction, so uh, he definitely gives us another kicking option. Um, and uh, it's it's so much more dangerous having him as having a fullback who's a left footer, and um, than having him stuck out to, on the wing where it's difficult to get the ball to him. So, look, it's an ideal game to to try him there. Um, and you know, if if it goes well, they they may further the experiment the following week. But uh, he should be getting a lot of possession and decent possession this weekend against Italy. Fiona, uh, Bernard's a tough man to please, you know what I mean? He gives out about Jacob Stockdale not being able to tackle Chelsea and Colby. There isn't a man alive who can tackle Colby at the moment. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I, like, I think um, there's no one really that's played their consistency. I know Sh Shane Daly, down a Munster has been, but obviously he didn't bring it in training that they felt that he warranted a uh, position in the 23. So 
of the three that are there in the back three, um, I think it's Stockdale's kick that has him in there ahead of the, the, the other two. But um, it'll be interesting to see how he covers that backfield. Um, you know, defence, I suppose, has probably been one of the weaker areas of the game, not just in Colby, in, in general, um, playing mm. for Ireland. So it'll be interesting now whether how he works with his two wingers and whether he's vocal enough to get them to support him. So, yeah, it's a, it's a huge game for him to... Because he hasn't been playing well in Ireland for the last year or so. Um, it'll be interesting to see how he fronts up. Yeah, and in fairness, you know, whereas you, when, we, when we talk about Jacob Stockdale, one of the main criticisms of him over the last couple of years has been his positional sense at times in defence, his ability to read when to break from the line and when not to. And at full back, like you're, you're very prone to exactly um, those points, you know, when to move, when to read a game at your positional sense. Like he could be found out very quickly if he's not comfortable in that 15 channel. Yeah, it almost seems like um, maybe his concentration sometimes goes, but I think Bernard was saying it a couple of weeks ago that, you know, he does probably get more touches on the ball at 15 as well, and maybe inadvertently that, that kind of greater involvement in attack actually leads to a bit more alertness with his defensive duties as well. I think, you know, there's definitely risk to it in a bizarre way to say about a debutant in, in Hugo Keenan. He, he might have actually been safer at 15 in terms of some of the nuts and bolts of the game, you know, than Stockdale. But um, I think it's it's a selection with Stockdale that's got a massive upside um, potentially. So, um, you know, there's no point us kind of, we, we, we've criticised conservative Ireland for a long time. So I think uh, until it goes wrong, you've got to, you've got to back the, the exciting selection in this case. Absolutely. Just to commit, just to commit on that to you, so... It actually should be easier for him to play fullback for Ireland than play on the wing defensively because of the system Andy Farrell uses. So, take for example, Leinster played his 13 2 defence and the 10 and 15 are back in the, in the backfield all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Andy Farrell, I know Simon Easter is doing the defence now, but what we've seen in the first three Six Nations game is that it's still Andy Farrell's system. The wings actually have a responsibility in the backfield uh, as well. So, there's more of a make a decision and, and reading it. So it's different. The, the Leinster wings stay high and that's all you have to do is defend what's in front of them. So potentially by playing fullback and actually being stuck in the backfield all the time, um, that will actually help him be better because I think what he struggles is making decisions and um, you know we, we put it down to lack of concentration. But I just think maybe his understanding of his role with Ireland as a winger and his, his responsibility to cover the backfield hasn't been great. Whereas now... He's back there all the time. He'd have Sexton back there with him. And, you know, Johnny will make sure he's in the right place uh, as often as he can. So it could be it could be a solution rather than, than more of a risk, just by the nature of, of how they defend. That's very interesting. And also, Birch, you'd have to say, this is the quickest back three that Ireland picked in a long, long time. And no disrespect to Rob Kearney, we know that Keith Earls is really quick and he was in there. But with Andrew Conway, with Jacob Stockdale, and now with Keenan as well as a seventh flyer, like the potential for attacking threat with that back three is absolutely enormous if they play the ball to their strengths. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and Conway's on form. Um, you know, Keenan would be brimming with confidence and, and Bundy and, and Ringrose have, have been really good. And I suppose the, the question marks are around the halfbacks. Um, obviously, Johnny's had a, you know, he's looked decent in the games he's played, but just with a hamstring injury that he went off against the dra- or after 10 minutes against the Dragons. Maybe he might be just a, a little bit match shy, but you know, if Murray and Sexton can get up to the level um, that they're capable of, that backline looks looks really exciting. It does. Okay, so Fiona, like I watched the Champions Cup final last weekend between Racing and Exeter, and it was a brilliant match. And it was a brilliant match because both teams came to play. Both teams threw it around. They were not afraid to take risks. They scored tries. It paid off at times. It cost them at times, but the result was a brilliant game. I want to see Ireland play this weekend. I'm sick and tired of watching this boring rugby that we've been conditioned into over the last few years. And successful as it was under Joe Schmidt, it wasn't very pretty to watch. We have the makings of a really good side there if we play to a certain way. I'd love to see Ireland have a go this weekend and then have a go against France as well. Do you think we'll get that? Well, I think it depends on a couple of things. I think it depends, one, on the weather, two, on whether the pack front up and give that fastball to those backs. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about them playing heads up rugby. Well, I'm sure they were doing that anyway, but it's the manner in which they do it and the speed of the ball that they get to allow them to do it. Um, and likewise, with the counter, I always felt that they were very conservative on their counter attack. With those back three, hopefully it will be a little bit more exciting um, if the weather conditions allow to it. And the game will be loose just because it is Italy. 
it's not playing down to Italy. It's making sure that they, and Andy Farrell said it, they've been ruthless and aggressive. Um, and I think they'll be able to play with that, with that good quality ball. Yeah, and like, I mean, it's actually, it's, it's not playing down to Italy, as you say, but we've got France the following week. And you would hope that they can put in whatever systems need a bit of air, airing and, and a bit of game time out, that they can perfect that over the course of 80 minutes so that by the time it comes to France, and they're going to have to be at 100% to, to try and beat them, that they will have ironed out any kind of deficiencies in them. So not so much a training ground practice match, if you like, but certainly an opportunity to put whatever they've been practicing into, into play. Yeah, and that would have been in their, in their mindset when they were going into this two weeks. Um, was about fin- winning the Six Nations because they're still in contention to do that, and they would have had France on that long on the long shot, like looking for them. And um, so I wouldn't say there'd be a huge amount of changes between this weekend and next if players front up and they play the way that Andy Farrell wants them to play. And it's, it, Wes, the question is, what way does Andy Farrell want them to play? Because we're still not sure. We're still not 100% sure what's Andy Farrell's stamp on his Irish team. I'd love now, with, with the kind of benefit of maybe the last few months or whatever. I don't know what, how much work he's been able to do, but certainly for him to have a think about how he wants to play the game, that we might see an involvement of what we saw versus the last match, which was getting walloped by England and trying to play the power game. Are we going to see something different, do you think? I think in fairness, we did see bits in the opening Six Nations games where there was an attempt to go wider at times, and I think it was, it was highlighted. But, I mean, I, I do have a bit of a... A bit of a bee in my bonnet with these ex-league guys. Sometimes uh, they kind of get billed as uh, gurus very handily, and uh, I suppose all Andy Farrell's work to date has been, you know, largely on the defensive side of the ball. And in fairness, Ireland's defence was was possibly the weakest area of their game for long long times during that. So, like, I don't want to be negative about it, but I mean, I do think the jury's very much out here. Um, and I do think if you'd have put that 23 up as what we'd travelled to Paris with six months ago, you wouldn't have given us a prayer in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'd be very hesitant about, uh, you know, being too optimistic about uh, about our prospect for two wins in this next, uh, in, in the Six Nations games before we get into this uh, Nations Cup or whatever it's called, you know. I think... Um, I, I think even a couple of weeks ago, um, this team, you wouldn't have put your money on this team being picked, especially, you know, at prop and in the second row. But, I mean, I guess injuries and suspension have obviously played a part. But there, there's definitely, um, partly by design maybe, but also by, by circumstance, there's, there's definitely a, a transition underway at this point. Um, and, and, and where it ends up, I mean, we'll wait and see, I think. Well, what do you want to see? What do you want to see this weekend? Like, he's used the word dynamic. He wants to see dynamic Ireland. I think it was I think it's unfair to say when you said that, you know, a lot of the rugby we played under Joe was, was, was boring or stayed or whatever. It was, though. It, it was, Wes. I think towards the end it was. I, I think at times at the start, when we, especially when we were winning a lot, I think we played some very good stuff. If you think back to when we won the championship in Paris, we scored some incredible tries. Um, so... I guess we'd like to see them be a little bit less prescriptive um, in an attacking sense, possibly. But, you know, it's, it, it's a fine line between less, being less prescriptive and kind of uh, not being prescriptive enough, I suppose. So, I mean, I know it sounds like you're never happy, but um, it, it's about well, you're never happy balance. anyway, regardless. You're never, you're a miserable pecker anyway. So it's right, about getting that balance for me. Okay. Well, Birch, okay. What, what would you like to see, ideally, this weekend? I mean, what's, what's a good return... This weekend, I'm going to be a bit tongue in cheek when I say it was boring stuff and Joe Smith, but to be honest with you, at the end of it, I, I was scratching my head saying, We're playing a game plan that doesn't suit the strengths of what we have. I want to see something different under Andy Farrell. I'm not quite sure that we're going to get it, but what do you want to see this weekend? Yeah, look, I think this weekend they have to go out and put on a, uh, a bit of a show, to be honest. I mean, realistically, as Wesley said, you wouldn't have picked that team, you know, six or seven weeks ago, but they're still good enough to go out and put Italy to the sword. And, I do think there's an ambition to play. I think Mike Cass, you know, listened to some of the players, you know, in, during, the last, during the Six Nations before it was stopped. They were talking around, you know, how they have a license to play, that they can take opportunity, take chances, take risks with offloads, etc. And against Scotland, they, when they had parity up front, or they, they didn't dominate Scotland up front, when they had parity in terms of power, you know, we did play some good stuff. And it was only really when we, um, you know, got completely out muscled against, um, against England and, and probably met our match against Wales that we looked a little bit gun-shy. So that's a challenge for us and it's the same challenge that 
you know, that the provinces have, you know, Ulster going to Toulouse, Leinster Saracens, is that when teams are bigger than us, um, which we'll face in Paris, that at the moment our our our, our lack of creativity uh, so far has has has, uh, has got us found out. So that's what he has to do. He has to develop a game plan that can outplay teams who are more powerful because unfortunately we're not going to get any more powerful uh, quickly. Uh, and I'm talking about power, I'm talking about South Africa, New Zealand, England, France. They seem to be a step above us at the at the minute. So, yeah, I'd like to see us starting to to really play fast, um, play high tempo, trusting our skill set and fitness. And, uh, yeah, I'm becoming, becoming harder to box in. Do you think Ty Byrne was the right call alongside James Ryan, uh, Birch? Um, no, also the lamb was obviously in the reckoning there. Um, Quinn Rue's name was up for grabs. Um, do you think he is the right player? Yeah, look, I think Ty Byrne. Ty Byrne's a phenomenal player. Um, he, he sometimes gets caught a little bit between being a six or, or a lock. Um, it would be interesting. Uh, you know, obviously Henderson being out and, and Baird being out made it uh, a little bit easier. I like Delan. Uh, I think he's very powerful. Um, I think he, he's been a good form for for Connacht so far. But Byrne is a he's a he, he is a match winner in his own right, and uh, I think he adds to that pack. To be honest. Yeah, Robbie Henshaw missed out as well, Fiona. Um, you know, I guess Bundyaki's form since the resumption of rugby has been standout for Connacht. He's been uh, attracting attention from everybody at the moment. So it does seem like the natural call to start him at, at 12. But like his partnership with, with Guy Ringrose, I mean, the, it's not exactly set in stone. Like I'm, I'm very interested to see how they'll bounce off each other as well. I don't think there's any surprises there with the way that Aki came back. And Gary has been consistently probably one of the best players in the country over the last year. So... In an attacking sense, I do think that they're definitely the best partnership. It's whether they link up defensively enough is going to be an important thing for them. But I think it's really important for Ireland to try and get the ball out to Gary Ringrose and see what he can do. And again, bring the back three into the game off him. Um, you know, Bundy just seems to just have this energy and he looks fitter than he has been ever before. So I, I think that's definitely the right decision to go with those two. And what about Keane Haley, uh, Fiona? Like in your position, he can get an awful time against Saracens. His confidence seems on the floor at the moment. Like he doesn't have Ty Furlong at the other side as well because of injury. I mean, it's it's massively important for Ireland that the scrum holds up, particularly against the French. Um, but Keane Healy, you'd imagine, just needs to get some game time on his bed and get his confidence back to the levels it should be. Yeah, look, you'd question this probably wouldn't be the starting front row if everyone was available, if Kelleher was available, if Furlong, um, if Kilcoyne was available. This probably wouldn't be the starting front row. Um, so they just have to go with it. You know, he is a player that has a huge amount of experience and he has to bring all that experience now, but he hasn't looked as sharp as, as he has in the past. I won't talk about uh, Saracen scrummaging. There was a bit of an illegality going on there, but, um, you know, I, I think it's that eight working together for the set piece is really important and not just pinning it on the props, uh, but we certainly will need him to stand up and take a lot of responsibility of, of the pack. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Chami's Cup final is, is kind of... Would you be convinced that Ed Byrne is a better player than James Cronin or Dennis Buckley? Um, I think he's I think he's improved significantly in the last year. Um, he's certainly bulked up. His set piece is very good. Um, you know, I I don't think there's much between them. As to be honest with you, I, like I don't think it's it's pretty much probably flip of a coin. Yeah. The what do you think, guys? A lot of selections like that, Hugh, I think, you know, that, I don't know, guys kind of came into the reckoning and have kind of stayed there. Like, e even, you know, Heffernan as well, uh, you know, you'd you just be a little unsure about some of them, I suppose. Um, again, I think it's probably a toss of a coin, which isn't necessarily um, the greatest sign that, um you know, you'd you'd like fellas to be to be kind of nailing their colours to the mast a bit more in some positions, I think. But but that could be a case of they haven't had the opportunities to date yet either. Is this your anti Leinster bias coming out of the way? <laughs> well, I don't think that Heffernan plays for Leinster, but if you, if you if you want to paint it that way, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about the bench then, Birch? Before we, we move on, um, I want to talk about Zion Zero and. and uh, Donica Ryan in particular. Um, as well as mentioned there, it's, it's a big chance for Jameson Gibson Park. Um, I, I know that Andy Farrell has said he, he brings something different um, to practice and particularly to training as well um, at Scrum Half. Are you, are you glad to see him get a run and, and do you think he deserves it? Yeah, he has. He, he is he's definitely different than the other Scrum Halves we have. Probably 
Casey's probably the most like him in terms of just bringing real tempo and um, sniping around the fringes and, and just he obviously doesn't have Casey's uh, probably physicality but he is uh, he is a live wire and I think that's probably what you need coming off the bench um, particularly you know with Connor's kind of game management being his strong point he, he, uh, he can definitely change it up with Gibson Park um, Heffernan Heffernan's a good player uh, Bealham I think is there ahead of Tom O'Toole just because um, he, he's probably a better or sorry a more experienced scrummager uh, I would say O'Toole will, will come through and, and pass him out and probably just because there's a little bit of a doubt around uh, Porter's ability at tight end at the moment. They've gone for the, the safer option there. And then, obviously, it's great to have Henshaw there. Obviously, you can play centre or, um, or obviously, he's covering fullback as well. And, and uh, maybe uh, yeah, covering fullback because, um, obviously, Hugo Keenan could uh, and Conway could swap in and out. So, uh, mm. yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's, look, it's, it's probably injuries and, and uh, suspension have, um, yeah, have, have affected it. But, uh, yeah, I don't think I don't, we shouldn't need them to come on to win the game. No, absolutely not. Right, let's talk about Simon Zebo, lads, because you know, Fiona, if all things been equal here, um, if Simon Zebo was playing in Ireland, he were a starting test full back, you know, for the next few years, unquestionably. I mean, he played brilliantly again at the weekend, a couple of tries, came off towards the end. He was unhappy about that, but probably just because of, um, you know, lack of match fitness, and I think he was cramping up towards the end. Like, we wouldn't even be having a conversation about Jacob Stockdale and Simon Zebo if he was playing in Ireland. The growing sense this week is that, look, we, you know, we need to cut our cloth here. We, we don't have the biggest pool of players in the world to choose from. We don't have players on Simon Zebo's level. Should the RFU at least amend the rules or bend the rules to include someone of his talents? We did it for, for Johnny Sexton. We've done it for a couple of players before. Why not for someone like Simon Zebo? Where do you stand on this? No, I don't think they should. Um, I do think it opens up the floodgates. Um to players going abroad and then the provinces are weaker and it just dilutes the whole system in Ireland. Um, look, there's no doubt about it. Zebo's gone over there and he's played incredibly well, but is that in the systems that they're playing? His linking up with Finn Rus Russell has been hugely exciting, but would that happen if he's playing in Ireland the way that Ireland play rugby? And it's so risky as well. We saw at the weekend how risky it was with Finn Russell playing the way he was. Um, but I think Ireland need to stay, stay firm on this. Um, they have a good player welfare system. Yes, they probably need to be a bit more battle-hardened, but I don't think allowing players go abroad and then be selected for Ireland will, will benefit Ireland in the long run. But it hasn't worked necessarily. I mean, like when we come to the World Cup, you know, in the last three, four World Cup cycles, we've been found wanting. I mean, are we being a bit too obtuse in our view here about players going abroad? And again, you know, can they not tailor the rules as such to not let the floodgates open but certainly when a player of Simon Zebo's quality um, is, is clearly a benefit to the squad can they not just adjust the rules to make it so that he can come back in is, is... but is one player going to make the difference in the squad, squad win in the World Cup do you know what I mean or one or two it's, it's the whole dynamics of the whole squad I don't think Simon Zebo coming in is going to actually win the Six Nations for them or, or beat France on his own Mm. Birch, what's your view on this? As someone who obviously uh, I'm, I'm starting to flip on this actually, and it's not just because of Simon, but it's actually increasing our player depth. So, um, and particularly for someone like Simon or or Dunica Ryan or, or, or Sean O'Brien, who have you know been great servants to the province and, and to Ireland, um, if they go abroad and they can you know keep their form, I think it's I think it's brilliant. I, I think it adds so effectively. It adds an extra player to our to our depth chart who's playing on a weekly basis. So if we have four provinces, and some of those positions are taken up by players who aren't Irish qualified, they don't not many, um, and you can add an extra layer uh, or two in each position. Uh, so for example, tight prop, you know, um, Furlong's injured. Mm. Uh, would it be if we had another two tight props playing one in the Viva Premier or the Gala Premiership and one in the Top 14? And, and I don't think there will be a, a floodgate because the reality is the Irish players are paid better than. Than abroad, and also with the crunch that's going to come financially now, um, you know the big the French clubs are, aren't going to come looking for our stars, and our stars won't leave because if you look at it, Dunica Ryan only left because the RFU wouldn't give him the two-year contract, which in fairness he's gone and proven that he probably deserved. Zebo left because he was being kicked off a national contract. So if a guy is leaving for a reason that he's, you know, he has to take a, a fifty or sixty percent pay cut to stay. Um, and he goes abroad and he and he proves himself. Um, I think that there should be a little bit of leeway. So I, you know, if a guy turns down an international contract, 
then maybe it's a little bit different. But if there's no international contract for him, I'd say fair play to him and, and let him go and, and play. And I think, look, it's a tax break to play here. You know, the international match fees you get to play here are, are, are very healthy. Um, you know, if you play for your province, you have a chance of winning things. There's loads of really positive reasons to stay. So I, I don't see there being a floodgate. You know, Irish players in general are slow to travel, you know. Um, and if you look at the last World Cup campaign as well, Birch, we brought, we brought an injured Joey Kirby to Japan. We had, yeah. uh, you know, with Jack Kirby coming in, who literally, like, wouldn't have been next or near the panel, only that the, the shortage was there and Kirby was, was such a suspect. We had a 59-year-old hooker who was also captain. Like, our squad depth and, and strength of depth is not actually what it has been held up to be. And, you know, in situations where it's a toss-up between, well, do you want to go and have success at in international level or do you, do you want to hold steadfast to a rule that actually is probably past its sell-by date um, and probably was, you know, had uses... 10, 15 years ago when you were trying to stop players on exodus, mass exodus leaving the country, it's probably not for fit for person, purpose anymore. Yeah, and in fairness, you are going to have lack of depth sometimes with only 14. So by making it as restrictive as it is, I, I think you, you, you kill yourself in the long run. And as I said, if, if Ireland had no, if the RFU had no money, and I know that's going to be an issue going forward, realistically, we're, we're not less well, we're no less than well off than the Scots, the Welsh, or even English clubs are going to suffer now. So I think we have enough positives that most people are going to stay. And if a player does leave and it leaves because he has been offered international contract or whatever, and he can go and bring his game to another level, and I don't need him, you know, and, um, and then I would say fair play. And I have, I have flipped on this. I, did, I do think the Irish system works, um, but I think there should be uh, a little bit of margin for, for the outliers. And again, it might be two or three players maximum that could add value but they're there and they're they're available for selection what do you think Wes? yeah i'd be on the fence i suppose as well um i do think it's definitely beneficial that the bulk of guys are playing here in terms of just even getting access to them from mini camps and things like that during the season um i suppose look if simon zebo was playing here right now would he be picked in that team to me he would that's not to say he would have been picked at every point over the last three years his form this season is much better than it was last season. Um, so, I don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, I think it could be detrimental if you lost a number of guys, but I wonder at the minute, um, would, would losing a, a hefty salary be something that, that the IRFU could, could potentially live with in the current climate? I know Birch is saying other unions are affected as much, but, but there probably is a situation with, with a handful of clubs in England and, and more so France where you know, the clubs are, are largely funded by, by independent benefactors anyway. So, um, you know, would the IRF you lament losing a, a four or 500 grand a year salary if that were an option? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair point. Okay. Um, Fiona, let's, can we talk about um, the Women's World Cup qualifiers? Obviously, Ireland playing Italy this weekend. And I'm interested to see what team is, is picked on Saturday night. It's live on RT television as well. Donny Book. Um, but just and, and before we get into that, you know, the World Cup is, is, is less than a year away now. Um, in fact, the draw is coming out, I think, in the next three or four weeks. And as things stand, we don't know if Ireland are even going to be there because they have to go through the qualifying system. Rugby Europe have suspended all games indefinitely because of uh, COVID. And it's just thrown everything up in the air. This can't be easy for the coach, can't be easy for the players or everyone associated with the squad. It's a bit of a mess at the moment. Yeah, it is. I think at the moment they have to plan as if they're playing those games in December. World Rugby and Rugby Europe are meeting to decide how to progress forward, whether it's going to be the top ranked team, which would be Spain, that just get automatic qualification into that um, World Cup qual European qualifier or not, um, or else push it out further. But if they continue to push it out, we're going to run out of time because there's the European World Cup qualifier and then there's if Ireland don't win that, then they still have another chance in, in a, a whole world repechage to get into it. So uh, if they keep pushing it out, it's going to be very close to uh, to the World Cup. So it'll be interesting come, what comes out of the conversations between World Rugby and Rugby Europe, how they, how they progress with it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, it's it obviously they need to get a handle on it. They're, they're very much reliant on what comes out of that meeting. Um, but, I mean, in terms of the squad atmosphere at the moment, they just kind of take Italy and France to come, concentrate on those games, and then whatever happens after that in terms of fixtures, they deal with at a later stage. Or does it get into the pair's mindset at all at this stage? No, I think currently they're going to be thinking that they're playing those games in December because the dates are set. So they'll be very much focused on the next two games in the Six Nations. Obviously, 
when they were set to be played originally it was to do with ranking for the World Cup qualifier but now that has gone out the window and it, they're all going to play every team so that doesn't make a difference um, but they're going to want to start nailing down what, who their team are particularly at out half over the last mm. three years they've had six different out halves and um, whether one of those players is now going to step up and take this mantle forward going into the World Cup I don't know but there's just I think that's going to be a key position for them and they just haven't seemed to be able to cement anyone into it is Clare still the number one ten, as far as you're concerned? I mean, when they name the team this weekend, I guess they'll we'll find out. I, I genuinely don't know. There's been so much mix and a match in between it. Yeah. I, 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 no one has really put their hand up and cemented the place. Um, so I, I do think that's a position that's up for for grabs. But who who gets it? I don't know. And overall, you know, just in terms of their progression, I mean, I remember we went to see them play um, in England last year and like they could themselves very well given the power and strength that England have and it does seem to be a huge improvement in the space of 12 uh, months from the previous Six Nations and they seem to be on the right track uh, and we don't know how that's going to manifest itself this weekend or whether they would have lost a lot of ground because of the, the, the break international it would be a terrible shame if they went backwards uh, given the progress that they made in the Six Nations earlier this year yeah, and the Italy game was always going to be the key game. Um, you know, I think they're both very evenly matched teams. Italy are now welcome back their full back for Alain, who's, who's a game changer for them. Um, but likewise, Ireland are welcome back Claire Malloy, who is probably the only world-class player that they do have. Uh, so she's a huge boost to the squad as well. So it'll be interesting how they come out of lockdown. Okay, all right. Um, so we're almost out of time. Um, gents, can I just ask you your prediction this weekend? Birch, um, Ireland to account for Italy fairly comfortably, would you say? Yeah, I'd say Ireland by 20. Wes? Yeah, should should do, I think. 15 points. Okay, and Fiona? Yeah, bo probably. bonus point win, so whatever way that works. All right, there we go. Win. Happy for Jacob Stockdale for the back. Okay, my thanks to uh, Birch, to uh, Wes and to Fiona. Live coverage of uh, RT, on RT television of the Ireland women's game against Italy this weekend and on radio as well with Michael Corn of Ireland against Italy uh, from the Aviva Stadium. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.